Our next speaker is a digital marketing consultant and president of Jeffalytics. He is also a speaker, teacher, board member for both the Minnesota Interactive Marketing Association and MN Search, and is adjunct faculty at the University of St. Thomas. He was named the 2012 CIO of the Year in Minneapolis St. Paul for Emerging Companies. Please welcome Jeff Sauer. I'm the analytics guy. That's what I do. So I was just joking about my photos. That, I did take that photo, but I was just joking about that. We're going to talk about analytics. That's really what I'm passionate about. That's my area. All these slides, you're going to get a lot of information coming up here in the next 20 minutes. So what I've done is I've made all this available to you on SlideShare. If you want to take a picture of that URL uh, or just download it later on, it's NW Analytics. First three letters are capitalized. It is case sensitive, so make sure you get that part. If you want to download this and you want to learn more or study some things or if you just don't like to write notes, it's all there for you. So why am I here? Because I love Google Analytics. I think earlier this morning we heard from Dean and what he said was he loves content management. So this is actually a really interesting conference for me to be at because it's a new group of people that I'm talking to that I have not talked to in the past. So just as I'm very passionate about analytics and measuring things on the web, there's a lot of people here who are very passionate about content, managing content, and just taking content and making it sure that it gets to the right place at the right time. Well, in addition to creating content, um, and, and, and managing it, I also create some myself. So I have a digital marketing blog and a travel blog where I write about this stuff all the time. So a lot of my experience with content comes from my own personal creation of content. And so not only do I love the analytics side, but I also love content as well. But maybe from a little bit different angle than, than what you might be hearing or what you might have heard already today. And so Google Analytics, the good news is that Google Analytics loves your content too. They, they have been working really hard within Google Analytics to give you different ways and, and new technologies and new methods to measure what's happening on your website and how your content is performing. And so we have about 20 minutes or so to go through uh, 10 tips that I'm going to give you that I've learned over the years. And some of these things are brand new emerging technologies. Some of these things have been around for a while. But ways that you can, you know, tips that you should take if you are trying to measure your content in Google Analytics. First thing is you got to collect the right data. So I was at the Google Analytics Summit last year, and the theme of the conference was access, empower, and act. Access is accessing the right data, so the ability to collect the right data for your website. Empower is when you can make it so that people within your organization are now empowered to look at that data and to use it in order to try and find ways to, you know, patterns in the data, to tell stories, to piece together what's happening for your company. And the last thing is act, which is actually acting on that data. And so I think that in, in the realm of websites, a lot of times access has been our biggest problem. In the past, you have the, you know, the IT person or the developer, whoever it is, who might make it so that you can't either access your web analytics reports or they make it difficult to get the right tracking in place. There's many barriers of entry just to get the access. Well, Google has decided, they, they released a product about a year to a year and a half ago called Google Tag Manager that allows you to solve the access problem once and for all. So instead of having to tag your website with all these different tracking pixels and different technologies and, and different ways of tracking things, you can use something called Google Tag Manager where you put one piece of code on your website and then you can serve up other tags through this interface on Google Tag Manager. So instead of having to go to your development team, to, your, to a consultant, whoever it is, or to IT, whoever it is that was controlling your website, every time you want to try something new, every time you want to do something like remarketing or run a display ad, you don't need to do that anymore because you can use something called Google Tag Manager to serve up those tags. So Google's working on solving that problem, accessing and getting the right data. And what that allows us to do is we can have website analytics come out of Google Tag Manager. We can easily get heat maps. If you've ever heard, ever heard of something called Clicktail, if you wanted to um, do heat maps as to what people are doing on the website, Google Tag Manager has an integration with Clicktail built right in. If you want to do remarketing, you can do remarketing lists through Tag Manager. There's advanced ways to do remarketing. You can do ad roll. You can do the Google products. All kinds of different remarketing is readily available within Google Tag Manager. 
You can do conversion tracking. Has anybody ever had trouble getting a conversion pixel for Google AdWords on their site or Bing ads? That, it's a difficult thing sometimes to get that even placed on your website. Using Tag Manager, it can become a breeze because you're adding it on there on your own, not having to go through the IT bottleneck. Audience measurement. If you use Comscore or any one of the major audience panel uh, measurement softwares, you can have a template built into Google Tag Manager where you can add that to your site without having to go through multiple layers of approval. And the last thing is display ads. So if you're doing any kind of display advertising, banner ads, you can track all that. You can put your double click, floodlight pixel, all kinds of different ways of tracking are built into this Google Tag Manager. So it's no longer a problem. And so what I look at it is, I almost say that um, it's a revolution for gaining insights for our website. We had such a labor intensive process previously just in order to measure and track things on our website. That's going away with Google Tag Manager because we're now able to access data in a very interesting way or in a very efficient way. And with the efficiency, we can spend our time doing other things. We can spend our time doing multi-tiered analysis. We can spend our time playing with the data, telling the story, and actually taking action to improve our website as opposed to just worrying about how do we get the right things tracked. Next thing, if you want to get good at analytics or if you want to start using this product more, you need to understand what's possible. And so I've used this, this adage in, in many of my talks because it, it always reigns true, but I've, I've always said that Google Analytics is like this game Othello. Has anybody ever played this game growing up or heard the commercials? They had a tagline at the end of it, and they said, a second to learn, a lifetime to master. And, and it's very true. It's very easy. If, if anybody, I'm, I'm guessing most of the people here have logged in or used Google Analytics. If you look at your dashboard and you've installed the code on your website, it's very easy to collect data. And it's very easy to understand what you're looking at. But also, there's much more to it that you need to dig deeper into if you really want to get the most out of Google Analytics. So what I've been saying is that it's a mile wide and a mile deep. And that's something that's easy to say, but it's hard to sort of demonstrate, isn't it? It's hard to actually understand what that means. So I, one of the things that I've done is I've created something called the periodic table of Google Analytics, which helps, you to, which helps describe all the different functionality that is available within the product. So if you're wondering, if, you, if you've gone into Google Analytics and, and you've only done one thing in there, well, guess what? There's 75 other options that you can do within your website. Some of it will be very relevant to what you're doing. Some of it maybe is not your core focus. But there's 75 other things you can do within Google Analytics that you should pay attention to. And if you go to that link, um, then you can get a PDF that you can download. And what I have a lot of people do is they print it out and put it on their cube wall, and then they can just pay attention to what's available in Google Analytics. So if you ever wanted to test yourself or understand, have you done a lot of these things, this periodic table is a good way to help you understand that. <coughs> Next thing we want to do is we want to turn data into knowledge. I really like this picture because it helps me understand some, where some of my frustrations have always come from when it comes to teaching people the value of or the difference between reporting and analysis, the difference between data and knowledge. And data is that raw, those raw facts, those raw things that we know happen. So if you log into any analytics tool or if you're looking at any kind of metrics or anything that you're looking at to measure what's happening on your website, that's just data. And, and in a vacuum, without any kind of context, it really doesn't mean much to the person that's receiving it. It might mean something to you, but it doesn't necessarily mean anything to anybody else. So what we need to do is we need to take that data and turn it into information and then ultimately turn it into knowledge. Because knowledge is what we really are, you know, knowledge is what we, achieve, or we strive to achieve and what we have, and that's our way of communicating what happened to the rest of our organization. So the sooner we can take these reports or this data that we have, turn it into valuable knowledge, institutional knowledge, information that, that goes along within our organization, the better we're gonna be. And since we're all storytellers here, the way that you might wanna think about it is that you can use this data to tell the story of what happened with your customer, what happened with the person visiting your website. Each person has a unique path to visiting your site. They came in one way or another, they visited this, they went to these pages, they, they discovered you through one source of traffic like email, maybe they came in through a paid search ad, however they came to your website, we ultimately need to piece together and tell that story to the rest of our organization to help prove not only the value of what we're doing, of what we did, but also prove the value of how do we go forward in the future? How do we make informed decisions and act on our next marketing campaign or for next year? How do we secure budget and things like that? 
Next thing we need to realize within analytics is that a customer is not a device. Now this is, um, the, after seeing the keynotes this morning, I think that I'm, I'm underselling um, the, what, what's happening here, but ultimately content is not, it's not a page. Content is what the person sees in the context that they see it. And so here's just an example of, you know, if somebody were to visit a site on their desktop computer, who, who has those nowadays, right? If, or if they're on their laptop or on their phone, each one of those people traditionally in analytics has been treated as a different person. So each device gets treated differently, even if it's the same person accessing that website. And that's been a problem with web analytics ever since web analytics became, ever since it was invented, because you only knew that that computer accessed a website, not the person. Well, Google has rolled out something on April 2nd, it became a, the default version of Google Analytics called Universal Analytics. And what Universal Analytics allows you to do is to, to put a unique ID on each device that can then tie it to that person using the device somewhere else. So instead of looking at it as just, just a, a laptop or, or a tablet, you can actually look at your whole consumer-centric uh, a consumer-centric point of view within Google Analytics. So just about any data that you collect on somebody can be tied to an individual or to, to a person as opposed to just to a, cert, a device that they're using. And that opens up a lot of really cool opportunities. Here's another visualization of it is that they really merge the data between these different devices we use and turn it into one cohesive, um, one cohesive view of the customer. And not only are, are we talking about devices like tablets and phones and laptops, but people have, I, I saw somebody use universal analytics to track bocce ball playing. So you can actually, you can, Google's allowing you to submit data into, into Google Analytics about any interaction you have with somebody. So not only is it limited to a computer device, but um, remember in this morning's keynote with Karen, she was talking about the kiosks. You could use a, a Google Analytics account with universal analytics to track kiosks people using those. If you, had analy if, you had a if you were in a car and you had Google on there and you logged into your Google account, you could track that person as being somebody in the car as well as when they're on their mobile device. So Google Analytics is now allowing you to track somebody as they go through these different areas. So not only is the content marketing and the content management world catching up, as you can see from the talks today, catching up to the idea that content is not necessarily a page, so is Google Analytics. They're realizing that people are all over the place. You need to have some kind of way of tracking them everywhere that they go. And you want to know that it's that single person as opposed to multiple people. All right, our fifth step. We want to be goal-oriented. One of the things that, that I always make sure people understand or I always ask people, and sometimes they have a good answer and sometimes they don't, is what is the purpose of your website? What is the purpose of your website? Sometimes we're so involved with what we're doing and so involved with projects or budgets or, or just the fact that it's always been that way, we don't ever ask ourselves that question, why? What is the purpose of doing this in the first place? Well, within Google Analytics, we have the ability to set up goals. I recommend to setting up two types of goals. The first one is a macro goal. And what we call a macro goal is ultimately your economic engine. It's how you make money. You can make money through e-commerce. Some of you might have e-commerce websites here. It might be through generating leads. It might be through selling ad clicks. It could be through any number of things that you make money off of your website. You need to set it up so that the things that make you money in your website are then tracked in Google Analytics as goals, because then you can not only report on what's working well, but also understand how much revenue it's generating per, per source of traffic, per piece of content, however you generate people to come to your website in interest, you can use these macro goals to help prove the value of what you're doing. The other thing is micro goals. Sometimes you have things that happen on your website that don't make you a dollar. They don't make you a single dime, but they're valuable. These are things that are valuable to have on your website, and, and they're there. Something like videos. If you went through the trouble of producing a bunch of videos for your website and you want to know if people are actually clicking on them, you can set a goal to say people are viewing the videos. And you can help understand, maybe, maybe it's just a fraction of a value of a sale, but you can give it a little bit of a value and help prove to your organization that we should continue to produce videos. Because we're showing that when people view videos, it, 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 it ends up making them successful later on across the process. So you can set goals for yourself, and then when you do that, it starts looking like this. So there's a goal report. This is just a profile where, um, if you look at this, the macro goals, there's not a lot of activity there, is there? There's, there's a couple hundred people who have, who have achieved these macro goals. 
Well, if you were to only concentrate on that, then it, you might be having trouble proving the value of everything you do on your website. But if you include micro goals in there, you'll find that not only are we making money off of, off of things directly, but we're also influencing our visitors, or we're also adding a lot more value to the equation in addition to that. Next, we're going to talk about content. So, so the rest of this is going to talk a lot about specifically about the content that you create and the content that's on your website. So this is, this is specifically for website content. You need to make sure that your content performs. Has anybody ever looked at the metric bounce rate on their website? That's, that's one of the most common things we look at. Um, since uh, Jeff had quoted Avinash earlier, Avinash is Google's analytics evangelist, digital marketing evangelist. He calls bounce rate, and forgive me if, if this offends you, but he says, I came, I puked, I left. And he basically says that somebody came to your website, they disliked it so much that they left right away. And essentially, a bounce rate means that somebody visited your website and never viewed another page. So essentially, a bounce rate, a high bounce rate means that a lot of people are coming in on this page and not going anywhere else. And in some cases, that's a very bad thing. If you have thousands and tens of thousands of pieces of content on your website, and your goal is to get them to view multiple pieces of content, if you're on a page view model for making your money, it's a bad thing if they come and leave. If you're generating leads and you have a one-page landing page with no navigation and, and all they can do is fill out a web form or call you or something like that, a high bounce rate might actually mean that you've made a lot of money. So bounce rate is something that I, I think it's good to look at, but I like to get beyond that. So here's a few things that I've, we've, come, we've come up with over the years that have helped us get beyond measuring just bounce rate. The first one is advanced content tracking. Now we know in a, in a, in a standard website, multiple things happen while you're viewing a page. How many of you open up an article in a tab and then get back to it like two months later? That's one of my bad habits. I open up a bunch of tabs and then never actually get to it. Well, that, that'll show up as a bounced visitor because they don't go anywhere else, but maybe that person really does have intent of doing something. Maybe when they get around to it, they're going to they're gonna find a lot of value in your article. They just didn't have time. They're busy in doing that. So. Um, this script by a guy who actually works at Google as well named Justin Catroni is called Advanced Content Tracking, and it allows us to track not only, um, not just when somebody comes to the website and whether they go to another page, but also what happens within that page. So if they actually load the whole website, it fires an event to let us know that that happened. If they scroll, which means that they go below the proverbial fold to get somewhere else, it then sends a script to Google to let you know that. And then at the bottom, when they beach, reach the bottom of your content, it sends a note to Google to say, hey, Google, this happened. They made it all the way through the page. Or if they reach the bottom of the page, it sends an event as well. And when those events are set, your bounce rate actually ends up getting improved. So if somebody, rather than saying that somebody visited a page and then never went anywhere else, now we can tell, we can affect our bounce rate by implementing this script to see, oh, well, if they made it halfway through the page, then that means that that's not a bounced visitor. That was actually an engaged visitor. So you can do some advanced scripting in order to improve on the default ways that Google Analytics tracks page views. The other thing is that they just released this. It's called content grouping. Now, I think most of the people in this room have gone through an exercise of mapping out the content for your website. So you might have groups of you know, categories of pages. You might have things that are aligned with your navigation. You know a lot about the, the hierarchy and the structure of your website. In the past, what would happen is if you wanted to report on how did this section of the website do, you'd need to download all the URLs and then write an Excel function that would say, if the URL begins with this, then, then group these together. And you'd have to do all this crazy like Excel pivoty, pivotry and stuff like that. Well, now it's built into Google Analytics. So if you want to, you can group your content together by like themes and do reports off of that. And so I set this up on Monday and on my website, and I, I just said, like, my Google Analytics posts, my PPC posts, and all that stuff, just to, just to experiment with this. This is a feature is about a month and a half old right now. And it helps me differentiate between when I write about this topic, how, are my, how am I performing compared to the rest of the articles that I've written on my website? So in this case, the metrics really aren't that different. Things haven't really changed that much between them. But if you do want to understand which topics should you be writing, writing about, you can use content grouping to understand which themes are performing the best for our website. You can even look at things like conversion rate, which, which themes are generating the most revenue 
or generating the most interest for our website. And in addition to looking at the content that's working and grouping it all together, landing pages, I think, are a really important aspect that we should be looking at as well. How many people pay attention to landing pages and, and look at reports on landing pages on their site? OK, so landing pages are ultimately, what is the draw? Like, what is the reason why all these people are lined up outside of this, outside of this building? Why are they going to your website? Um, I, I think you can appreciate my beautiful Photoshop work where I put yourwebsite.com for the building. Um, why are they going to your website? Well, the landing page helps you understand that. So a landing page, it means many things to many people. If you're in paid search, it means one thing. If you're, on, if you're a landing page optimization specialist, it means something else. But in the case of Google Analytics, it, just, it means the first page that somebody entered your site on. So what was the first page they viewed on that particular visit to your site, or that session, as they call it now? Okay, so that's the landing page. This helps you understand what's the draw. What, is the, what, what are the things that you did that made people come to your website. For many of you who are established and have a strong brand, it's going to be your home page. Your home page is going to be your number one landing page. In my case, I don't have an established brand, so it's actually other pages further down, or other pages that I wrote, that are the way that people are getting in there. So it's nice to know what is the draw, because then you can say, well, these are the five things that are really drawing the majority of customers or the majority of visitors to my site. I should do more of that. And even further, um, in Google Analytics, there's this thing called a secondary dimension, which is this tab up here. And you can then segment your landing pages by any other number of metrics. And the one that I like to segment by is which pages did they land on, and then how did they get there? So I look at the source of traffic in the medium, and I can understand now that this one article, it's because of organic search, because people are searching on Google, finding this article, and ending up on my website. That is the main reason why it works. So if I'm trying to, if I have an initiative or if I'm responsible for organic search, what am I going to do next? I'm going to go and try to write more articles or more topics that are like that. I'm going to, I'm going to, re, or I'm going to deconstruct that content and understand why does Google like it so much? Why is that content doing so well? I'm going to understand, is it, is it keywords? Is it the topic? Is it the length of the content? What are the properties that make this thing do so well? So looking at a report like this can help you understand what are the properties that make my website perform? What are the, why are the, are the good things happening to me? And also, if something's not happening that's good or something that is, is underwhelming for you as far as performance goes, you can look at it that way as well. You can look at it critically and say, why is this not working? And I'll get into that in just a second. Actually, I'm going to get to it now. So the next thing you got to do, and this is somewhat of a Google Analytics thing, but somewhat of just, just good marketing, you need to promote your content. You can't just put it out there in a vacuum and expect that it's going to get picked up. And, and I, I've made that mistake sometimes. You, you spend a lot of time creating a piece of content or writing an article, whatever it is. You create a white paper, and then nobody downloads it. How deflating is that? When you create something, you spend all this time, you have committee meetings, you have all these meetings to talk about what you're going to do, you have a graphic designer, you have a copywriter, an editor, uh, your web person's putting it out there, all these different things involved, and then nobody sees it. It's crazy, isn't it? I hate that. So what I started to do is I created some rules for myself for engagement to make sure that I was getting the most value out of the content that I created. Rule number one, the more time you spend writing, the more time you should spend promoting. If you wrote something in 30 minutes and just threw it up there on a blog, you probably don't need to spend, you know, you don't need to necessarily spend all your time promoting that piece of content because you didn't necessarily put a lot of effort into it in the first place. But if you created a white paper, if you created something that took you a week or a month or however long it was in order to get, out, get that out there and you think it's really good, then you should definitely spend focus on promoting it as well. You can't just expect that everybody's going to find it. I, I would love it if I wrote something good and everybody knew that as a filter, but we need to curate ourselves sometimes and just let people know this is a good one. This is one I spent a lot of time on. Looking at Google Analytics, there's something called time spent on page, and there's also the, the concept of a visit. So you can calculate, and I'll show you this calculation in just a second here. You can calculate how much time is spent on your pages and how many people visited it. And if the amount of time you spent writing something or your collective team put to, spent putting together a piece of content, if that's less than the amount of time that people have actually viewed it, that's a pretty bad sign in my book. That means that people are not finding it or it's not resonating with them. So that's a good sign that you need to start promoting even more. 
Um, another thing, reach out to people, to your peers, people who are either, you know, either not competitive with you or competitive with you but play nicely. Um, let them know, hey, I put a lot of effort into this article. Can you promote it? Sometimes that outreach is what pushes things over the edge. One of the examples for me is I reached out, I had created something and I didn't think that it was doing well enough for me. It was like an SEO case study and I spent about 40 hours on it. I created all these different websites and did all this analysis and everything like that and barely anybody went to it. So I reached out to the number one guy in SEO and I said, hey, can you promote this for me? I'm, I'm, I put so much time into it. This is my best possible work. He promoted it and it made all the difference. It was about 20 or 30 times more people ended up finding it because I did that. And the only reason why I did it is because I didn't want to spend 40 hours on something and then throw it away. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to get the most value out of it possible. But when you do that, don't do it every time. There's people who outreach to me, who reach out to me every single day when they post something new and they go, oh, can you send this out for me? Can you promote this for me? If you do that to me, that's the fastest way for me to just ban you or delete you or just never, never listen to what you're doing. Do it sparingly and do it smart. Only have somebody promote your best content. Make sure it's relevant. Find the right people to do that for your content. Then here's how I figured out that calculation. So you have your average time on page, and you have your total page views per page. If you just multiply those two things together, you're going to get a rough idea of how many minutes people have spent consuming the content you've created. And you probably should know, or maybe, maybe you know how much time you spent creating that content, or maybe not. But if you know how much time you spent creating it, you can just do an eyeball test and say, am I getting the value out of this that I wanted? Is that what's happening? All right, we're getting, getting close. Well, two more things. One is to prove the value of what we're doing. And so this is, this is a consumer uh, purchase funnel, decision funnel. It actually came somewhat loosely based on something from the Google Think Insights team. And they're basically showing us the process that somebody goes through when purchasing something. And this is actually in the home improvement industry that they were showing. So they start out by research, you know, generating ideas for designing their house. They might try to do it yourself. They might say, I'm going to do it myself, or they might not. They might do research on the products that can, if they're not doing it themselves, what products can they buy? And then they start doing product comparison, and they start, and then hopefully they ultimately purchase something. Sometimes they don't, but hopefully they end up purchasing something. Well, at the top of the funnel, the ways that people are finding these things, a lot of times are organic search, social media, uh, content marketing, and, and email, email nurturing. You know, somebody might um, come into your website, fill out a web form, you might capture their email address, and then you might nurture them in order to get them, you know, nurture them, send them messages until they're ready to buy. Well, the things that end up bringing in the purchases at the end are often paid search, email, and landing pages. Those are usually what, what bring in the actual purchase intent at the end. So in a traditional web analytics model, who, who do you think wins here? The person at the bottom almost always wins because they get 100% of the credit for that sale, even if that person visited your website 20 times before doing their research. And I'll link a lot of us in here Maybe some of you are in charge of paid media, but I think, I'm, I'm thinking that a lot of people here are in charge of content and these things that are actually towards the top of the funnel. So you might not be getting all the credit for what you, that you deserve for what you do. So within Google Analytics, there's a few reports that you can run that can at least help you understand, are you getting credit for all the value you create? The first one's called the multi-channel funnel. And this gives you a Venn diagram as to when somebody purchases from your website after more than one visit, what, how are they overlapping? So how are people coming in there? So for example, in this case, there's people who are visiting your website through social media and then coming back directly to your website. And there's a large number of people who end up purchasing after doing that. Well, if you're in charge of social media and social media is always the first thing that people do to get to your website, wouldn't you want to get some kind of credit for that? Wouldn't you want to be able to show this diagram and say, hey, you're giving all the credit to direct, but in reality, social has a huge influence on people coming to our website. And then if you drill down into this report, there's something called an assisted conversion. So not only are you looking at direct last click conversions, but you can also say we assisted, just like in hockey or, or soccer where, or basketball, you know, there's, there's the person who scores the point, but an assist is also very valuable. In some sports, it's equally valuable as the goal itself. And so this assisted conversion can help you understand exactly how much revenue did you get. And in this particular example, if you were in charge of referrals or the referral traffic, generating referral traffic to your website, you'd be able to claim a lot more money now from the assisted conversion um, based on 
based on this type of analysis. You can say, oh, well, we influenced, not only did we get direct value of $250,000 of sales, but we also had another fifty dollars or $60,000 of revenue coming in from things that we influenced. And then if you're looking at budget, or if you're, if you're trying to get, you know, justify, hey, I need another FTE to do really do this right, you can look at this report and say, hey, this might be the reason why, this might be the indicator as to why we need to have more people on this team. So I know that's one of the biggest problems we have is, is resource constraints. And if we rely too much on just the analytics tool or any kind of metric that, re that only shows us the last thing that they did to purchase, then we're not going to be able to prove all that value. Another thing they have in Google Analytics is called attribution modeling. It's where you can create a model of somebody's purchase path. Now, traditionally, last interaction is usually what gets the most credit in a web analytics tool, things like Google AdWords. It's always last click in attribution. Well, there's other models you can look at. First click, where you give all the credit, 100% of the credit, to the first time that they found your website. You can do that in Google Analytics. A linear one, where you just give every touch point an equal value. Time decay, where the, the most recent thing gets the most value, but it also goes back and assigns some kind of revenue value to other ones. And, and all kinds of different uh, models that you want to put in place. This used to be something that Google charged $150,000 a year to use. Now it's free to all of you. If you've set up those goals that we talked about in step five, this report is available to you for free in Google Analytics. Now it becomes more valuable if you do things like macro and micro goals. It becomes more valuable if you properly configure the tool. But it's available for you right now in this free tool. Pretty cool. I know Jeff was talking about that earlier, where it was not available, or you know, they've come a really long way in taking these things, features out of the paid, the, the 800-pound gorilla tools, and now they're adding them into this free tool, which is really cool. And then here's another one where if you look at these, these different sources, search, social, referral are not getting enough credit. They're not getting their proper due. If you look at a last-click model, if you move to first-click, you're getting a little bit more value. Now this is, this is, you know, it depends on the size of your website. Um, in this case, the referrals, they're, they, they're, under, they're getting undercredited by almost $100,000. So if your website, you know, that $100,000 in many businesses is, is, is an FTE. It's a full-time employee's value in there. So if you're not getting credit for an entire employee's worth of revenue or, or employee's worth of salary, then that can be a problem. So looking at these models can help you prove your story a little bit better to your organization. Last thing is going to talk about, this is like the evolution of this stuff, and this is sort of selling the dream, but I'm also working on, on models to get this done in a very practical way, and that is calculating the return on our investment. Now, there's a lot of different things. You, you see like presentations about social media ROI, and there's, ROI, there's an ROI metric in Google Analytics that's terrible. There's all kinds of different talks about ROI. But what I found is that they're all wrong, because they took a look at it from the marketer's perspective and not from the perspective of a business owner. And I didn't realize this until I became a business owner myself. And that is that I don't give a crap about any of these reports. Or any, if, just because it says ROI doesn't mean that it's useful for me. I just don't care. Here's how you calculate ROI in a way that a business owner really cares about. First thing you need, you have revenue. So in Google Analytics, if you're doing e-commerce, you know your revenue. If you're not doing e-commerce, then you might have to know your revenue through um, offline attribution, through your CRM system, or through a, 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 another tool. But you need to have your revenue. You need to back out how much you invested in advertising. Okay, so most times that, that Google calculates ROI is actually just revenue from advertising investment. And that's what they call it, it's return on your ad spend. You also need to understand how much you spent on the product. So I have this example, I wrote a blog post about this, it's really embarrassing, but I was running an online store, and every time that I sold something online, Google told me that I had 1,000% ROI, so I put a dollar in and I made $11. I lost money on every single sale because my product cost and my fixed costs were out of control. So I relied too heavily on this metric that they were showing me and I didn't do it the right way by saying, well, I also need to back out how much money I spent for that product and then also fixed costs. So a product cost is variable. Depending on the product, you have your margins and things like that. You need to back that out. There's also fixed costs. So if you have an e-commerce website, and, and, and ultimately that tells you your net profit, which is a good number to have, that's actually how much money you made from doing this advertising. And then what we need to get to is run this equation to understand our return on investment. So you take your profit, which we had 
learn in the last one, divide it by, or subtract out your investment and then divide it by your cost of investment. And then you'll have your true return on investment. How much did you put in and how much did you get in a return as far as what people actually care about? Now, what ends up happening is if you don't use this method, this is, what a, uh, this is what a CFO looks at. If you don't use this method and you're showing them something else, your numbers are not going to align and they're not going to have faith in what you're showing them. So getting onto the level of understanding how people think that are in, in charge of a P&L and in charge of profitability for the company, the sooner you can understand that that's how they think, and this took me about eight years to figure out how to do this and how, how they work, the sooner you can figure that out, I think the better off you're going to be and the more you can do things like justify and prove that you need to have a certain budget. Strong ROI equals bigger budget. And so that's, that's what I wanted to share with you, things you can do in Google Analytics um, around your content marketing and hopefully that does it for you. And once again, you can download the slides there. <laughs>